Hello, I'm Dr. Jane McCartney. I'm a consultant chartered psychologist in the UK and I love anything to do with human behaviour, but particularly crime. And in the psychology crime videos, I aim to give you what I speculate may have been going on for somebody inside their head when they committed the crimes and kind of events before and after. So in today's episode, I wanted to look at Levi Belfield. Now, he's a notorious murderer in the UK and he's particularly linked with some really gruesome, savage attacks on a number of women, but he's he's probably most well known for the abduction and murder of teenager Millie Dowler. Now, he was also jailed, when he finally was jailed and caught and jailed, he was also jailed for the murder of Marsha MacDonald, who was 19, Amélie Delagrange, who was 22, there was Millie, who was in her early teens, and the attempted murder of an 18-year-old called Kate Sheedy. He has been a person of interest for many attacks and some murders, but mostly attacks on other women. Now, his MO would be to target blonde women. He had a pathological hatred of blonde women, and I'm going to come on to potentially why a little bit later. So looking at his background, he was one of many children. He would go on himself to carry that uh, particular baton on and he has somewhere between 11 and 13 children himself and had started at quite a young age so seemingly he was really coddled by his mother and he could do well he could do wrong in her eyes but it didn't matter there was never any implications for him so his major life lessons as he was growing up was it's fine whatever you do mummy will probably say it's fine and you don't have to answer to anybody for your actions. Now it was interesting when he was being interviewed by the police. You, there's some footage of him, and I'll put that up as well. He he kind of sits there and, and sucks his thumb almost, and he's he's cross armed, and he just wouldn't say anything. He was doing no comments, but he was just sitting there like a little baby, almost sucking his thumb. And you could argue that's reverting back to when I was younger. I never got into trouble. It didn't matter what I did. And there's plenty of suggestions that his crime spree start his crime spree started many many years before so brought up by his mother father died at an early age one of i think it was about six so attention within those families usually has to be spread but seemingly a lot of attention would go on him D didn't do terribly well at school would leave and he would get into low level drug dealing security will clamping all the things that enabled him especially the will clamping business to be able to keep swapping his cars all the time because when Millie was abducted they were looking for a particular car which they just couldn't find and it turned out because he was he was just changing his car all the time he was not exactly one step ahead of the police but he was certainly frustrating the police by not being able to find him now his hatred of blonde women, and this has come from one of his ex-partners, who, interestingly, when she was interviewed, I've seen some television interviews, her, she's got the blondest hair possible, and it's her way of saying, you have no control over me anymore. And she would say that he would rip pages in magazines if he saw blonde women, he'd stab them. He had an absolute pathological hatred of blonde women. And all of his victims were either blonde or very light haired. And I think the reason being that he was probably rejected when he was younger. Apparently he was quite short. He had a squeaky voice. He was quite dumpy. But he obviously had fancies and potentially sexual urges and want an interest in, in girls, other girls. But he was rejected and he would have probably taken that home, complained to his mother who would say well, they're not worth it. They're all, you know, sluts and slags and only people like me, you know, I'm the only decent female in your life and perhaps if you can find somebody and carve them in my image, they might be half the person I am. But as for the rest, forget them. And it would grow, this, this pathological hatred would grow. So he would, his MO would be to go around the streets. He knew the streets of South West London really well through his security and just growing up and car clamping business as well. 
And if he saw a blonde girl, he would just go up behind. So they were kind of planned, but not planned. So he didn't obviously know that he was going to attack that particular person, but he'd be going around looking and wanting to enact a revenge on them. And if he's enacting a revenge on them, then he's making himself feel better about himself because of the humiliation of the rejection and the abandonment of these women and the self-worth dropping and the I'm not good enough. Those feelings that he would have felt all the way back there were being momentarily assuaged by him brutally murdering a blonde woman and of course to him that would be that's just another blonde off the street so I'm bizarrely doing a favour for society. So if we go on now to look at his personality and then I'm just going to add to that a little bit about possibly what he was thinking at certain times in his life. So if we think about Belfield and we'll use the five factor model which looks at the five big personality traits that we all have and the acronym is OCEAN to help you remember which is openness to new experiences conscientiousness, extrovertism, agreeableness and neuroticism. Now, on the openness to new experiences, I think he scores pretty low because his world was that little bit of South West London and he knew that and he knew what he was doing all the time. So he wasn't really interested in imagining or thinking about or enjoying anything new. And the conscientiousness... Again, low if you're going to go around assaulting people, controlling people, manipulating people, then your conscience and your ep empathy, of course, is very, very low. Extrovertism, again, very low. This is probably, again, to do with his past, you know, those humiliating times where he'd be turned down and rejected. So his extrovertism in the right, in, in the wrong circumstances wouldn't be very high. But I believe that potentially when he was playing the big I am, he would be the extrovert. He'd let everybody know. But I think that was driven by um, not an extrovertism as in being sociable and outgoing. That was probably more driven by fear. So I'd really put that as, as potentially, you know, the actual classic characteristics. I put those as low. Agreeableness, very low. Again, you know, his agreeableness meaning was he trustworthy? Was he helpful? Was he cheery? None of those things, unless it was on his terms. So again, low. And his neuroticism, his awkwardness, his fear, his instability of mood, I put that very high. So now if we go on to potentially what his thoughts were, now remember, this is just me speculating, you know, based on many hours and hours of clinical experience. So when he would attack at random, as I said before, it was planned and an attack was planned but the specific person apart from being blonde wouldn't have been planned so the motivation and the thoughts that would be going through his head at that time literally you know as we imagine him running down what not following some poor girl who doesn't know he's there or literally running some other girl over would have been revenge revenge for the rejection, revenge for the humiliation, revenge for the abandonment, revenge for the knock to his ego and self-esteem. And in his head, he was justifying that. I'm getting rid of you, one less blonde, then the world is going to be a better place. In his twisted logic, the world is going to be a better place. Now, if we think about when he was with the police, he was this kind of blokey and this charming self, and he was very, very concerned about how he came over. And there's a story about after one of his trials and he wouldn't turn up for a lot of them because he would say that the press are against him. You know, he's a multi murderer. He's snatched people off the street. Of course, the press aren't going to have anything terribly nice to say about him. But he would complain about that. He would complain about the press coverage. He wanted to be seen in a certain light, whatever that was when you're standing trial for murder. I'm not entirely sure. But he didn't want to be seen in the way that the press were portraying him. And interestingly, at one of the trials that he did turn up with, after the day's proceedings or something, he was overheard saying, I think either t t to a journalist or, or one of the prison guards or something, he was overheard saying something along the lines of, how, how was that? How did I come over? Do you think they, they, they listened to what I had to say? He was really concerned about what, anything about him. And I think that's 
probably one of the things that would in, ignite his fury and his anger if he thought that he his appearance was slighted at all. And interestingly, years later, on a kind of Friends Reunited site, he would say, I'm going to quote this, feeling stupid coming on here, I was short at school, now over six foot, ha ha. And then goes on to say about his own security and door cl um, and wheel clamping company. And then admits to still not having grown up. So he's still that baby. He still reverts to that baby when he suits him. And then talks about going out endlessly clubbing. And this is where he would meet the vulnerable girls, the girls that had potentially little life experience because they were so young. Or they didn't have proper social support that were going to steer the likes of Belfield away from them or family support. So he'd pick his targets really carefully as narcissists will do. And that's what Belfield is. He's a psychotic narcissist. So those are my thoughts on Belfield. And I wanted to particularly bring up this case because there are obviously similarities to what's going on in South London at the moment. It's March 2021 when I'm filming this. And some two weeks ago, some 33-year-old young woman was just walking home having been with friends and she was snatched off the streets I'm not going to say anything about the potential perpetrator because I don't want anything to be used that might implicate on any forthcoming judicial hearings or anything but it, what has happened in this case and obviously it's been then compounded by certain actions by certain authorities about people that wanted to just go and pay their respects. I personally went to the bandstand on Clapham Common and paid my respects on Saturday evening and then left before all the all the um, nastiness and aggravation kicked off. Because it's scary being a woman. It's scary being a woman in London and it's dark and it's scary being a woman and young girl in New York, Los Angeles, any part. It's just scary sometimes. And this is the point that people are making. And it's taken the abduction and murder of one poor young girl to kickstart a debate and so many people coming out and saying, yeah, I, there's been many times where I've been harassed or assaulted and called all sorts of names. I could count dozens of times this has happened so yeah those are thoughts on Belfield and all respect to obviously all his victims all their families and those of Sarah Overyard as well keep safe and I will be along with another psychology of crime shortly <laughs>